Happy Friday, y'all. Good morning, good afternoon, good noon. For those of you who are um, suffering acute bloating, um, that's totally okay. For those of you in heart failure, oh my gosh, I'm sorry, come visit me. Um, and for those of you who are not either of those things, uh, you probably didn't celebrate Thanksgiving or probably celebrated it differently than I did because I'm definitely bloated. Um, and the only reason I'm not in heart failure is because my love, Prof Rez, is here keeping my heart beating strong. And by the way, that just re represents one of three flirtatious lines I've sent to Prof Rez already today. Um, <laughs> and it's extreme blushing. Are you regretting giving me the intro, Prof Rez? You could have done it. <laughs> you could have done it. And we could have been uh, already talking about the case. One quick sec. My mom is messaging me. Make sure she's still okay. My um, favorite time is when Robbie's mom gets involved in the picture. Because that's the only time you'll see Robbie stumble his words. <laughs> so I just wish she would come always on stage because it would just make me look better as Ravi is struggling. <laughs> For those of you who don't know, Prof. Rez is referencing a recent RLR case where my mom, despite my pleads with her not to uh, uh, interrupt our recording, comes in and just, she's on the phone. I'm like, hey, mom, we're like recording now. She's like, oh, okay. And then she's like, hey, I have to stop talking now. <laughs> But anyway, uh, enough of me rambling. Uh, we're thrilled to have one of our very own in the case presenter seat today. Um, and that case presenter is Promise. Please go ahead and unmute. Um, uh, reintroduce yourself maybe to the group, the group of people who don't know you. And for those that do, give us a little bit of update on where life has taken you in the last few months. And uh, after that, we'll jump right in. Everyone, um, it's so good to be back. Uh, my name is Promise. I am a fourth year medical student um, applying to internal medicine right now. And then let's see, life-wise, honestly, the past couple of weeks have just been busy with interviews. And then a family member who got pretty sick was in the ICU, but um, thankfully he's now stabilized and got discharged last week. So that's been it but I'm excited to share this case with you guys. Well, th thank you for sharing that promise. And thank you that you're, uh, I'm thankful that your family member got discharged. Uh, excited to co-discuss this with Robbie. And who's scribing and teaching today? I will do scribing. Elena, do you want to just say a few words? Yes, uh, I'm a medical student as well. Um, I'm in my last year. And I've recently joined uh, uh, the CP Solvers, and I'm excited to be here. Thank you for being here, Elena. And who's teaching? Hi, Dr. Prof. I'm Umbish. I'm teaching today. And <laughs> I'm hi. really excited that, hi, nice to meet you. I'm excited that it's an RLR, and I've known Promise and you I haven't really talked to both of you in, uh, in a virtual, you know, in-person setting. So I'm really excited, huge fan, and excited for this case. Thank you for being here, Umbesh. All right, Promise, take us on this journey, please. Okay, um, for the first Alquat, if that's okay with you guys, I'll just go ahead and jump into the whole HPI. Um, so this is a 27 year old male with recently diagnosed HIV. Um, that's on heart therapy. And then he also has CKD5 presented to the ED after a uh, possible seizure. He reports not feeling well for the past couple of days with some chills, dizziness, and uh, lethargy. And then he said that his legs felt very weak. He collapsed and then fell while he was trying to walk to the bathroom in the morning. EMS was called because there was concern for seizure. And then per the EMS, there was a witness two minute seizure, which then spontaneously aborted. But there was some confusion whether or not that was actually a seizure. Um, he denies hitting his head, denies any bowel or bladder incontinence, any focal shaking or post ictal state. He also reports having intermittent neck swelling and new onset swelling in groin and armpits. 
he noticed uh, the next swelling got worse, subsided, and then in the past couple of days worsened to the point where his speech became muffled and then having a little bit of shorter breath because of that, but he's still able to swallow. He also denies any recent fevers and um, unintentional weight loss, loss of appetite, uh, and then no abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting, um, pretty much the rest of the ROS is negative. Wow, promise. What a HPI you provided for us. Very rich. And there's no way I can single-handedly tackle this HPI. And I think <clears throat> what I'm going to focus on is the recent diagnosis of HIV and the antiretroviral therapy, and then leave the rest for, Ra for Robbie. I almost said Ravi, Robbie to tackle. <laughs> and this is why I want to focus on this, because when we diagnose someone with HIV, we ought to start antiretroviral therapy pretty quickly. There's a few exceptions in this where initiation of ART should be delayed. And those exceptions include TB meningitis and cryptococcal meningitis. Now, why is it that we have to think twice before initiating our anti antiretroviral therapy in that context is because when you start giving someone ART and you see that virus go down, the immune system wakes up. And if that immune system wakes up, it's going to try to eradicate any of infection that exists. And in the brain, this is the skull. The skull can't expand anymore. So if you have inflammation within the brain because you have an infection there, all of a sudden you're at risk of increased intracranial pressure and herniation of the brain. So what I really wanna take two minutes and talk to you about is iris. You all have probably heard this term, immune reconstitution inflammatory syndrome, but it's very tricky. It's not simple because how many of you have heard paradoxical iris? How many of you have heard unmasking iris? And quite frankly, we've done a deep dive in this and there is no formal diagnostic criteria for iris. But let me share a few pearls of wisdom with you that will make this topic make sense. The people who are at greatest risk of iris include those who have a very high viral load and a very low CD4 count they're at the greatest risk of developing iris. And I would say those factors and whether there's an infection, and this is where I think, Robbie, you're gonna love this pearl. It's not just infection, I'll tell you more in a second. So if someone has a very high viral load, if they have a very low CD4 count, all of a sudden you give them this very effective medication and what ends up happening? The virus goes down, the immune system wakes up, and now we're ready to go to battle with whatever infection may or may not exist. Now, here's the thing. It's not that it, it has to be an existing infection. It just has to be an antigen. It doesn't matter. You see, what ends up happening is when you have HIV, where do your CD4 cells go? They try to escape the bloodstream and they go into the lymphoid organs because they don't want to get attacked by the virus. So those CD4 cells, who have been fighting infections in your body as immune cells, they're now hiding from the virus and their antigen is hiding from the immune system that's compromised. Then you give the antiretroviral therapy, all of a sudden they feel brave. They come in to the bloodstream and now the antigen that the immune system hasn't seen is being exposed. So when we use the phrase paradoxical iris, it's just telling us that someone who's been treated for an infection or is actively getting treated for an opportunistic infection, the most common being pneumocystis gerevechi pneumonia, herpes viruses like CMV, um, but really any opportunistic infection you can have iris to. 
cells. Now you get paradoxical worsening because those cells are showing the antigens to the immune system. Unmasking iris is different. Unmasking iris is this, is that the patient hasn't been treated. The physicians are, and clinicians are not aware of the infection that exists in this individual until the immune system wakes up. So this might be someone with TB. This is very common. There's TB, it's hiding in the background. The immune system wakes up, boom, you get TB iris. You can get MAC iris. You can get cryptococcal iris. You can get CMV iris. And here's where it gets interesting. It's not only infections, even cancers like Kaposi sarcoma can all of a sudden become evident with reconstitution of the immune system and also autoimmune diseases, anything that is antigen dependent process can wake up. So when I see this, like Robbie will talk about the rest of the history, but I know immediately that iris, and there's no strict tempo for the various infections. It can be one month, it can be two months, it can be up to six months. What I do know is I have to really understand, was there any opportunistic infection in the background? And now that the immune system is awake, am I unmasking an infection? Or am I just causing a paradoxical worsening from a prior treated infection? And the paradoxical worsening has less, it's usually a self-limited process, less of an inflammatory syndrome, while the unmasking iris is robust reaction from the competent immune system. Mike, to you, Robbie John. Oh, that was absolutely superb. I was waiting for this teaching because I know it's coming out in video form soon. And we got a little sneak preview today. That was amazing. I love the distinction between unmasking and paradoxical iris and the fact that it's on your radar for this person adds to the um, uh, the concern, um, not just HIV related, but heart related issues. And I think the, the, the core question that we have here promised, and I think the one that EMS was grappling with is do spontaneous abnormal movements in a patient with loss of consciousness, what do they mean? So if somebody has loss of consciousness and they're having rhythmic movements, the initial lay public's uh, response will be that is a seizure for sure. And that's definitely a possibility. However, equally likely based on just the observation that the patient is having symmetric rhythmical movements is syncope. And the rationale for that is hypoxemia and hypoperfusion induces the same movement abnormalities in patients. And so right now, if you are just witnessing symmetric rhythmic jerking of a patient who is in, uh, who is um, uh, confused, uh, who is um, uh, unconscious, you do not know for a fact whether it's seizure or syncope. Of course, if you're lucky enough to have an arterial line and you can look at the blood pressure tracing and see that it is low or undetectable, it's syncope. And if it's normal, it's seizure. More likely, what you're studying is the events right before the rhythmic movement and then right after. And if a patient focally has focal movements followed by rhythmic symmetrical jerking, that's much more likely to be a focal seizure that then generalized. Um, and if the patient has confusion thereafter, that's much more likely that they have something intrinsically wrong in their brain rather than a reaction to something else. So I think that the distinction between seizure and syncope at this at this point is impossible. And the progress one can make is to upload the notion that syncope can also cause abnormal movements, but they have to be symmetric. So here, both are still at play. Um, and the fact that he has no postictal confusion reduces the probability of seizure and heightens the possibility of syncope, though the possibilities of both are likely enough that each um, uh, uh, possibility will have to be investigated in parallel. But that investigation is not happening in a vacuum as it often is. It's happening in a very specific dynamic story. And that dynamic story involves the neck, the groin, and shortness of breath. And it's very probable that the event that happened to this patient represents progression of the story that he's been suffering from rather than an independent event. But I think if you're tracking the assumptions you're making, you're probably saying that the uh, amplitude of the disease process that's going on has risen and risen and risen, ultimately culminating in this disease process, though they may be true, true, and unrelated. But using that as an assumption, the question then becomes, well, what is what inferences can we make about the state of his neck and his groin? And a good place to start is the neck because it's the most morbid, and you can see that morbidity 
and how it is affecting uh, his airway. So whenever you have any space occupying lesion in the neck, the first priority is complications to those things. And those complications include airway compression and they include esophageal compression, but they also include vascular compression causing uh, carotid, um, either uh, um, stenosis causing hypoperfusion or embolic strokes. And they also include the possibility of a neck hematoma and bleeding into the neck. So all those are considerations in this patient and they'll mandate rapid imaging. And the imaging modality that this person will need will undoubtedly be a CT neck with contrast, probably amongst other imaging to understand what this is. But if you're trying to um, have a pretest probability on what that CT neck might show, um, you're looking again for consequences, airway, esophagus, carotid, but you're trying to understand the cause. And as a general notion, whenever there's a space occupying process anywhere, the core question is, is it an inherent structure that the patient has that has evolved into taking up more space? Good examples of that would be hepatomegaly, splenomegaly, lymphadenopathy. Or is the space occupying process inherently pathologic because it's not supposed to be there, such as a liver abscess? So if you're really trying to think simplistically about this neck, you're wondering, is it a normal neck structure that has gotten enlarged? Or is it a process that should never, ever, ever be there? And it turns out in the neck, the most common explanations for neck masses are things that are usually there then enlarge, with the leading culprit being lymph nodes. So all you really have to do is picture the anatomy of the neck and think, well, what else is, what else is there? Lymph nodes, most common followed closely by thyroid disease, followed closely by salivary disease. So the most common causes of a neck mass are lymph nodes, the thyroid, and salivary glands. There are less common considerations, including enlargement, pathologic enlargement of congenital uh, uh, um, cysts, and more morbidly pathological in involvement of the vessels, including uh, an IJ, uh, internal jugular problem, or even a carotid problem. The symmetry here makes you wonder, well, what else is on all sides of the neck? Along with the uh, intertriginous involvement, the growing in the armpits, supports the notion that this person likely has disseminated lymphadenopathy, which is a notion that is certainly influenced by the fact that he has HIV, uh, a virus that is inherently uh, uh, lymphotropic and also exposes the patient to a wide variety of complications related to lymph nodes, be it infectious, autoimmune, or malignant. So I think the chances that this person has lymph nodes in his neck and his groin is very high. The concern would be that it is causing airway compression. And the question will be, well, what happened to him right now? Does he have that same process in his brain causing him disease? Does he have that same process affecting his heart in some way, shape, or form? Or less commonly, did he have a transient occlusion of his airway and actually have an event uh, more along the lines of the consequences of transient airway occlusion uh, from the space occupying lesion? So those are the thoughts crossing my mind, but the immediate steps will be to understand what the brain and heart fingerprint of this disease process followed by a close exam and then imaging to understand uh, what the space occupying process is. Higher promise, tell us more, please. Yeah, I love the discussion and just how quickly Reza already pointed into something that's really important to consider for patients who have just diagnosed with HIV and how, um, Robbie, you kind of broke down how to approach the neck swelling. Um, so for the next aliquot, in terms of his past medical history, it's just HIV and then the CKD secondary to FSGS. Um, and the renal biopsy said that it is most likely due to HIV. And in terms of his medication, he was initially on Bitarv and Bactrim, but then he had a recent hospitalization about a month ago for lower extremity swelling and worsening CKD which therefore um, he was switched to levanumide and dolutegravir. Um, and then 
He is also on Lasix for the lower extremity swelling, and he reports that the swelling has improved recently, and he's on atopicum for PJP prophylaxis. Show show history wise, um, nothing really remarkable. He denies any kind of recreational drug use or alcohol or tobacco or marijuana use. Um, he lives with his family and um, he has been taking all his medications, doesn't miss any doses. Family history, nothing remarkable. Um, I will also give the vitals. Um, his temperature is 97.5 Fahrenheit. Blood pressure is 117 over 52. Pulse is 101. Respiratory rate is 33, setting 99% on room air. Do you guys want physical exam or do you want me to pause right here? Let's do it. Why not? Okay. Physical exam. Um, he appears uncomfortable uh, and pale in terms of H-E-E-N-T. He has muffled voice. Um, otherwise, he uh, his mucous membrane looks dry and then there's no oral lesion appreciated. Lungs wise is clear to auscultation bilaterally. No wheezes, rails, or ronchi or crackles. Uh, cardiovascular, pretty much all normal. And then um, abdomen wise, um, soft, non-tender, non-distended. Extremities, no lower extremity edema is warm, two plus uh, radial pulse or um, DP bilaterally. And then musculoskeletal, there's bulky bilateral, submandibular, axillary, and groin lymphadenopathy. Skin is hype. There is a hypopigmented macule over the right shin and no rashes or lesions in any other location. Neurostatus, he's alert and oriented times four. Absolutely fascinating. Uh, maybe I'll leave the exam for Prof. Rez and I'll kind of just share the the question of, wait, hold on, this is a 27-year-old man with CKD and essentially peridialysis CKD. And it just goes to remind you that if you're trying to make a uh, big picture, uh, if you're trying to develop a big picture understanding of the complications related to HIV, I think the ones that are inflammatory in nature get our attention and get our priority. And we learn about the long list of infections and cancers related to HIV. Um, but this case is a great reminder that patients accumulate a lot of non-inflammatory consequences as a result of this infection. And you can kind of go from head to toe. Neurologically, the entity of HIV-related dementia occurs in patients with long-standing, well-controlled HIV. And going down into um, the thoracic structures, patients can get an ILD related to HIV called lymphocytic interstitial pneumonitis or pneumonia, LIP, into the heart patients get many cardiac complications that are non-inflammatory in nature, including um, getting coronary artery disease, pulmonary hypertension, and HIV-related cardiomyopathy. So this is not to say that, um, uh, that we should know an exhaustive list of non-inflammatory consequences of HIV, but I promise you there exists one for every single organ, and that's true for the kidneys as well. Patients with HIV are at risk of getting what he likely has, which is called HIV-related glomerulopathy, where they get a tubulo interstitial and glomerular disease, often um, in the context of uncontrolled HIV diagnosis. Um, and it um, uh, can progress, can, can present with rapidly progressive glomerular disease. Um, and the good news is that a fraction of patients improve with antiretroviral therapy. So the link between his kidney dysfunction and his HIV is very well described, is often uh, glomerular in nature, and usually um, presents in patients with um, low CD4 counts and a high viral load. So not only do we have to track what complications he has that are inflammatory in nature, but specific end organ complications affect virtually every organ, including the kidneys. Um, you're also seeing how um, the... Uh, treatment for HIV can affect the kidneys too. Notoriously, tenofovir, uh, an agent uh, that is first line in many instances, is implicated both in causing a Fanconi syndrome and also in causing tubular interstitial nephritis, though the former Fanconi's is much more. So here, the past medical history and its implications to HIV is not surprising. 
It is a reminder of the non-inflammatory arm of this disease and the uh, overall incredibly miraculous medications while having a undoubted market net benefit, not only carry the risk of iris, but also carry the risk of end organ damage, including tenofovir for uh, for the kidney. All righty, Mike to you, Prof. Rez. As always, thank you, Robbie, for being an encyclopedia of knowledge. I, I'm worried about this patient. And I will tell you something that you'll be taught early in your training is being very cautious with interpretation of vital signs in patients who are immunocompromised or who are elderly. And so here, the normal temperature is not reassuring one bit. This is a young individual. Look at that respiratory rate. There's a mismatch between the respiratory rate and the oxygen saturation. Now this can be due to a metabolic acidosis. So it's gonna be very interesting when we look at the lactate and the BMP, but note that this patient is very, very sick. And it would be helpful to know what was the status of his lymph nodes weeks prior uh, when he was last seen in the hospital, because that gives us a clue to what we might be dealing with. Like if I told you I had a lymph node that's slowly growing, you'll be saying, well, maybe you're dealing with an indolent process. But what if I told you this lymph node is expanding rapidly? Now you're saying, okay, am I worried for an aggressive lymphoma? Or is this some type of infection that is just acting up. And whenever you have um, lymphadenopathy, the important thing is this, you have to ask the question, can you arrive at a diagnosis without a biopsy? And I bet you in this particular case, probably not. Um, the instances where you might be able to arrive at a diagnosis without a biopsy is, for example, in the infection category, someone has HIV, but we know this patient has HIV. Someone has the other infectious mononucleoses like EBV, CMV, or someone has an autoimmune disease like lupus or Sjogren. So sending the ANA, for example. So here, Robbie, I'm already priming my mind that I'm going to probably need to access a lymph node. And then the question becomes, which lymph node and what type of biopsy? You want to access a lymph node that is safest to access. And what you want to do is remove as much of the lymph node as possible, meaning FNA is often non-diagnostic. Then you have core and then you have excisional. Excisional is probably the best approach to um, lymphadenopathy because it allows you to view the entire architecture. Some of these diagnoses of lymphadenopathy are pathological diagnoses, meaning that the pathologist says, hey, Robbie, this looks like Castleman's disease. You know, you can't say it's Castleman's until the pathologist tells you. That's why the entire architecture is important. And that's also applies to lymphoma and lymphoma mimickers. But before we talk, I'm going to actually make one more comment. You don't want to shy away from this macule on the shin. Now, it would be really helpful to actually um, see this macule because it's hard to know. Is it red? Is it vascular? Is it that he just hit his shin on a, a piece of table and has some bleeding there? That is very possible. But if you start thinking skin and HIV and lymphadenopathy, you're like, okay, could this be a clue to what's happening in the lymph nodes like a Kaposi sarcoma? Could this be a bacillary angiomatosis? A lot of these are virus related uh, in the compromised immune system. And then we notice that he's pale as well. So back to Robbie's point, could there also be an, uh, a hemolytic process through an, like an autoimmune hemolytic anemia because the immune system is revved up? So I'm going to be paying close attention to the CBC. We're going to be paying close attention to the LDH. We'll get all of the labs, but more important than any of this, and Robbie, I actually would love your expertise here. More important than any of this, is that this guy's voice is muffled and I'm worried about like compromise happening in the upper airway. So I would love to hear from you as, you know, the ED doctor, who are you consulting? Are you starting stare? Like, how do you navigate this? I know you're not seeing the patient in front of you, but let's say based on what was presented, how do you navigate that, my friend? 
Uh, Fraz, I think that's such a fantastic question, honestly, and I'm so appreciative that you're pausing there because I kind of skipped over it in my mind, so focused on the diagnostic thing, but that you could never skip over that in real life. Some very practical things I've learned on the job here and not in, in, in medicine residency is positioning. So you want this patient to be able to breathe as comfortably as possible. And so you want their diaphragm to be as comfortable as possible, which means moving their stomach out of the way. And the best way to do that is to have a patient sitting upright. The next step is to ask yourself, can I see why this person's voice is muffled? And you might be able to see it with your eyes by looking in the back of their throat or feel it with your hands by pressing on their neck. And here, we're able to feel it by pressing with their hands on their neck. But the question will be, can we see it with our eyes? Um, and then uh, the, the, the question is about stability about whether this person needs to be intubated for airway protection alone. And that is very much a judgment call that takes into account two factors. The first is, how much is the patient working to bypass this obstruction? Do they have visible accessory work of breathing by retracting their intercostal muscles or their neck muscles? And so one is, how much work is being done to bypass this obstruction? And then two, what are the cumulative conse consequences of this obstruction with regards to how much oral secretions they're having? So if you walk into this room and you see this person has saliva coming out of their mouth, they're going to be intubated that next minute. Or if you walk into the room and that you see that the patient is really, really huffing and puffing as evidenced by a respiratory rate of 33, um, you're going to probably be moving very quickly to secure that airway. Um, the question that you might have is it's going to take a minute or two to secure that airway is, are there any things that are rapidly reversible? And the answer is yes. The only thing that is rapidly reversible here is anaphylaxis, where the administration of IM epinephrine and the use of other adjunctive medications may rescue the patient um, from the need for intubation, but this person is certainly heading there. So uh, you might ask, well, um, what can I do in the meantime? And in the meantime, um, asking, you need good eyes on seeing how tight this airway is. Um, and the tightness of the airway can be assessed by direct laryngoscopy with ENT. So what they do is they take a camera up the nose down into the airway and visualize both how bad is it and then more likely what is it. So... Um, uh, the the reflex use uh, that ENT will often use in these situations is the use of steroids or dexamethasone specifically for airway edema. This is a very complicated decision to, to do so here for one reason, and that one reason is steroids are associated with a high risk of flaring patients with undiagnosed Kaposi sarcoma. So a very, very rare but important consideration here is, should I give this person steroids for their airway edema? And that's, it's a very hard question because of the possibility of um, uh, Kaposi's iris, which we actually had the pleasure of learning from an expert, um, um, uh, experts at Emory two or three weeks ago. So um, Prof. Rez, I think this is a very tenuous situation. I don't think that the person has a rapidly reversible cause of airway obstruction and the respiratory rate of 33 would probably require securing the airway soon, I would guess, especially given the likely need for imaging of the neck, which will require the patient to be in the flat position for that imaging. You can't keep him upright the whole time. So if I were taking care of the patient, I would definitely call ENT and call uh, anesthesia uh, for the possibility that he needs um, securing of his airway. I am biased. I know that patient, uh, the patient was taken care of by promise on her MICU rotation. So that may have slipped into my thinking too. Um, but uh, I'm, glad I, I, I'm glad I stole all the credit for my thinking before I, re <laughs> I revealed that. <laughs> um, yeah, I promise. Tell us more, please. What happened? Yeah, so um, this is actually not uh, my patients, and I try to look for a picture for that uh, lesion um, in the chart, but there unfortunately wasn't one, um, but I did see that it's more of a scar, and that had happened um, several years ago, so it doesn't seem like a new macule lesion, um, and then with regards to the uh, studies. I can give you CBC, his white blood cells is 20, hemoglobin is 3.3, platelets is 19, 
MCV is 87, uh, RDW is 18. And one month ago, his hemoglobin was 9.3 and platelet was 156. BMP wise, his sodium was uh, 116, potassium 6.9, chloride 86, bicarb 10, BUN 118, creatinine is 8.3. His baseline was four to five. Uh, calcium 7.4, magnesium 2.8, FOS 8.5. And then his repeated potassium after like urgent like hyperkinemia management was 6.3. And then LFTs, his ALT is 12, AST is 24, ALFOS 650, T Billy is 0 0.8, D Billy is 0 0.4, total protein is 6.5, albumin is 1.5, uh, GGT is normal. And then the COAC labs, his PTT is 26, IRNR is 1.6. Um, I'll also give EKG and chest x-ray. I promise, before you do that, can you do me a favor? If you have this in text format, can you put it in the chat? Because um, you, uh, it's a little difficult to keep up. It's a lot of info. That would be helpful for us. Yeah. Um, I'm actually going to go into the whiteboard and just help type right now. Oh, okay. Thank you. Yeah, I wouldn't be able to keep up either, but thank you, I promise. I guess, Robbie, in the meantime, maybe I can just start discussing as they're filling in this whiteboard and um, we're gonna get more data, but this CVC is striking, isn't it, my friend? It's striking. This CBC um, with the hemoglobin of 3.3 and a platelet count of 19 mm -hmm. should make you pause and ask the question, are you having uncontrolled hemolysis specifically in the form of a microangiopathic hemolytic anemia? Now you may say, wait a minute, Reza, why is the MCV not higher if you have reticulocytes coming out of that bone marrow with a volume of about 112 fentoliters. The truth is, it's you don't know what the baseline MCV was in this patient. And whenever you see this combination of anemia and thrombocytopenia, you just have to think about the Mahas. And these include, the prototypical examples is TTP, HUS, DIC, but you can also get it in the context of malignancy, antiphospholipid syndrome, and other etiologies, which I don't think I need to say right now. So I want a smear stat, and um, I want to send hemolysis labs, which include the LDH, the haptoglobin, and then my eye will scan the AST and the ALT, but note that it's not always the case that the AST is high in the context of hemolysis, you'll look at the bilirubin and be like, wait, wait a minute, why is the bilirubin just 0 0.8? Can you still have hemolysis? The answer is absolutely, you can still have hemolysis. And I think you have to operate under that hypothesis. And Robbie, go look at his illness script for TTP. One of the secondary drivers of TTB is HIV, but this is an HIV de novo. This is HIV on antiretroviral therapy. So I think you have to really um, assess the smear and see if there's even a single schistocyte, but you have to also be open to the possibility of Evans syndrome, which is just a fancy way of saying autoimmune hemolytic anemia and immune mediated thrombocytopenia. So this immune system could be so revved up leading to the lymphadenopathy and then also leading to ITP and autoimmune hemolytic anemia. And that white blood cell count of 20 does not mean that this patient's CD4 count is very high, not at all. Of course, you're gonna look at the diff of that um, white blood cell count, but it's not a reassuring finding. And um, I think it's gonna be very important branch point in evaluating this anemia. So you'll send iron studies, you'll send the reticulocyte, you'll send the hemolysis labs, but then you scan down and you're like, wait a minute, is that sodium? 116. Wow. And this patient's voice is a bit muffled and there was concern that he may have had a seizure. 
that is a severe hyponatremia. That alone, independent of respiratory status, will get you in the ICU and under close monitoring. So the prior sodium is also going to be helpful from like the 1.5 month ago, but I'm assuming it wasn't 116. And when you're dealing with hyponatremia, especially in this context, I think the first step is getting that serum osmolality. Oftentimes in the hospital, we have hypoosmolar hyponatremia from decreased effective blood volume, either due to you know blood or due to volume loss in the context of diarrhea or you're not drinking enough, or because you have an organ down, the heart, the liver, the kidney, and you're just not perfusing well. So you have decreased volume. But this degree of hyponatremia would prompt the serum osms. It would also prompt the urine osms and then a urine sodium. But the urine sodium is gonna be very difficult to interpret here because it's almost impossible to diagnose SIADH in the context of renal injury. And we, we know with, so this is a very challenging case. Like when I look at that hyponatremia, honestly, my system one thinking is, could he have like a disseminated granulomatous process also knocking down his adrenal gland? So I'm worried about adrenal insufficiency. When I look at that, I'm also worried about potentially SIADH, but I know it's going to be very difficult to tease these out. I know a component of that hyponatremia is just from his CKD and volume overload. So I'm going through all of that. And I'm like realizing it's going to be really hard for me to pinpoint. But what I do know is I got to bring that sodium up. And what I do know is I can't do it at a rate quicker than six to eight milliequivalents in 24 hours, or he's also at risk of osmotic demyelination uh, syndrome. The FOS being guy with the lymphadenopathy, this again, Robbie, we're in a difficult state. Like how much of this is CKD or how much of this is increased cell turnover? Could this patient be in a state of tumor lysis syndrome with uric acid crystals worsening his baseline kidney function. I think a uric acid level is helpful. I learned this recently from Robbie. If it's greater than 14, it's unlikely to just be explained by the kidney. And there's probably additional um, cell lysis. And then promise tells us the alkalis is elevated, but the GGT is normal. So that takes us away from the liver and puts us primarily in the bone. So now I'm worried about a disseminated process that's not only knocking the lymph nodes, but might be involving the bones and involving the marrow. And remember, when you have alkalis elevation, it's more consistent with an osteoblastic activity than, you, than an osteolytic, because it's the osteoblasts that activate that enzyme of the alkalis. So I think bottom line is the following. When I look at this patient, he's very sick. I'm worried about his airway. He was recently started on antiretroviral therapy I'm most worried for a disseminated granulomatous process, be it atypical infection that is flaring or a lymphoproliferative process, lymphoma and its mimickers. And I'm concerned that in starting the ART, we may have unmasked something, but I have to rule out life-threatening etiologies like TTP. So a smear looking for schistocytes is critical. And we're going to slowly rise that sodium, but I'm also worried about potentially adrenal insufficiency. So I'll look at the eosinophils on that diff, though the blood pressure right now is normal. This was so much data. And I know Ravi has some sugary stuff to powder on that. Anything else, Ravi, grab your attention here. Not my dear friend. I think that's absolutely superb. And as a thought exercise for all of you, um, to think about how can you make progress on the acute on chronic kidney dysfunction in a patient based on their blood pressure. And I think the question will be, is this glomerular, is this glomerular disease with a normal blood pressure? Is this tubular disease with a normal blood pressure? Is this interstitial disease with a normal blood pressure? Or is this vascular disease with a normal blood pressure? And I think that the, uh, the analysis of a patient who is normotensive with worsening kidney dysfunction allows you to say, hey, while I worry significantly about glomerular disease in a patient with hypoalbuminemia and AKI, I think the normal blood pressure makes that possibility less likely. So for me, I think normotension does not eliminate the scariest possibilities of glomerular and vascular diseases related to uh, mahas, et cetera, but it certainly reduces it. Um, and so for me, I think that's a soft clue that of all the hypotheses we should have, 
tumor lysis affecting the tubulo interstitium um, is gaining momentum based on that finding alone. So to summarize, I think it's really crucial to use the blood pressure to help you analyze acute on chronic kidney dysfunction. Patients with AKI or AKI on CKD who are hypertensive often have a vascular disease, either at the glomerulus or at the larger arterioles that are affected in a microangiopathic hemolytic process. So AKI plus hypertension, think maha and think glomerular. AKI without hypertension is often tubulo interstitial. But this data finding alone is not supreme and is just a small piece in an otherwise big, big, big puzzle, but reinforces the hypothesis of lysis affecting the tubular interstitial. Not enough to eliminate those possibilities, but enough to have a leading thought of that given everything else that's going on too. I promise, tell us more, please. Yeah, so um, we were definitely most concerned about his... Uh, renal status and then is um, potentially having like infectious um, etiology. So there was a very big infectious workup send. And then he's also getting um, emergent dialysis just because of the uh, kidney, acute uh, kidney failure, and then all the metabolic um, derangements. And then the third thing that we were really worried about is the hematologic status. So the bicytopenia and that. So I think those will be like kind of the workup that I'll focus on mostly. And then the other problem, it's more in the background for now. Um, so with the um, infectious workup, uh, his uh, CMV, EBV, Legionella, Histo, Blasto, uh, Quantiferin Gold, Toxo, parvovirus and crypto are all negative. And then respiratory PCR, um, pneumocystic panel are also negative. UA is also negative. And then uh, hepatitis panel is also negative. And then with regards to the uh, heme stuff, um, hemolysis labs um, came back. His LDH is 313. Hapto is 150, retic is 1.5, fibrinogen is 418. I'll type it in a chat. And then um, he is positive for uh, uh, direct, uh, like the combs positive. And uh, we sent a G6PD and smear wise, there's no schistocytes, but they saw abundant microspherocytosis and Rolex formation. Um, and then let's see, after transfusion, his platelet went up to 20s and then it went back to 10 after 12 hours. So he's been transfusion resistant. Um, let's see. Do you want the pause? Oh, uric acid is 10.5. I can also give a uh, CT neck for you guys. So let's see. we pan scanned him actually, because we were very worried about him. So uh, his CT neck, because of his kidneys, um, he could, uh, there is a non-contrast study. So the neck showed bulky bilateral cervical lymphadenopathy. Uh, findings are non-specific in a setting of HIV, cannot exclude lymphoma or any lymphoproliferative disorder. Uh, there is some fluid overload and bilateral pleural effusions that's greater on the right than the left. And then there's also um, fluid attenuating lesions and bilateral parotids. And then in terms of the chest, abdomen, and pelvis, um, pretty consistent with what is seen in the neck and the chest x-ray. Bilateral pleural effusions, right greater than left. And then they are seeing some... Um, Posterior, posterior right upper lobe airspace changes um, that could be inflammatory or infectious process. Some ground grass opacities may be due to volume overload or congestive failure or um, hypoalbuminemia. And then enlarged axillary, hilar, and mediastinal lymph nodes. And then also it's, they saw a hepatosplenomegaly and enlarged retroperitoneal lymph nodes. Um, and we wanted to do a biopsy, an existential biopsy for one of his lymph nodes, but he was 
pretty unstable, so we have to hold off with that. Um, promise, I can't believe this is a patient you didn't see. I think you seem to know them in such a um, high detail, and the way you're telling the story is just so logical based on the prior data. I really, really admire it. Promise, I'll just like, there's, I think there's, there's two cases too complicated to divide and conquer, so I'll just share some thoughts and then would love for you to reflect on them. And I think the general progress we've made is re anchored in the reality that most patients with HIV-related lymphadenopathy either have an infection or have a cancer. Autoimmune diseases are super rare in this context, and I think the overwhelming amount of data is pushing us more and more to cancer, not just because so many of the infectious studies are negative, with the notable absence of one really important one, uh, and that is Mycobacterium avium intracellulare MAC. Black blood cultures would be very helpful here, so that's a gap. And of course, there are other gaps too, um, uh, but the finding of lymphadenopathy hepatosplenomegaly with relative sparing of the lungs, the most common portal for granulomatous infections, really pushes us towards the hematological malignancy category, especially when you're seeing the effects on the autoantibody formation. And so hematological conditions are notorious <clears throat> for inducing autoantibodies to the hematological system. And here, I think the positive direct Coombs is supportive of that notion. Um, and so the smear here is uh, evocative of the possibility of autoimmune hemolytic anemia, not just because it's occurring in the context of a positive Coombs, um, which would be um, uh, almost diagnostic of that, but you also see spherocytes in Rouleau. So I think um, this is um, certainly a, a very good case for autoimmune hemolytic anemia, but it's interesting that the patient's LDH is only mildly elevated and the patient's haptoglobin is normal, supporting the notion that even though he's at risk for autoimmune hemolytic anemia and might be having some, the amount of anemia he's having, a hemoglobin drop of six points, does not seem to be in proportion to the amount of hemolysis he's having, implicating another independent mechanism for it. And that mechanism is likely the tumor itself. And so I think for me, this conversation is becoming more and more and more about what kind of um, <clears throat> what kind of uh, hematological malignancy this person has. Of course, the first and most important thought will be lymphoma, um, and um, uh, and its cousins in the context of HIV are Kaposi's sarcoma and Castleman's disease. And I think we often grapple about um, what disease is at play. Uh, in large part because we know that ultimately, no matter what we say, a biopsy is needed for this patient. But I think PROMISE is showing us just how important it is to have a pretest probability because biopsy may be tricky and complicated. So the question before us now is if we are gaining confidence towards the hematological malignancy category, what tests can we obtain short of a biopsy that may influence our, um, our analysis? And this is a great uh, point to emphasize that um, testing for Castleman's disease can be, you can make a decent amount of progress serologically with analysis of, uh, of the cytokines that um, the patient might have in his body with elevations of VEGF and elevations of IL-6 um, being most characteristics of Castleman's disease. So for me, I think that um, we made a lot of progress towards the, uh, the hematological malignancy category. And I think that... Um, the most common by far and away are lymphomas, though Castleman's and Kaposi's are important to analyze. Um, Kaposi's sarcoma is highly unlikely to occur without overt cutaneous or mucocutaneous manifestations. So for me, I think that um, uh, it's really between lymphoma and Castleman's with lymphoma being much more common, but um, Castleman's being here suggested by two things. The first is that the patient has um, uh, has marked kidney injury without evidence of uh, overt tumor lysis explaining that uh, kidney injury. And it's very interesting to study the overlap of Castleman's and kidney disease. And I learned this from getting it wrong alongside Prof. Raz in a case that Harry Hoare presented to us from, uh, 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 from maybe two or three years ago at Grand Rounds. So Profres, that's where I'm at. I think it's really um, more heme malignancy. I think chaos is unlikely based on the skin lesions. Base rate, lymphoma, lymphoma, lymphoma. The uh, kidney injury that appears out of proportion to the uric acid, along with some other clues that we may talk about later, um, has me a little bit worried that this person might have Castleman's enough 
to um, send off the um, cytokine profile on the VEGF in case a biopsy may prove too difficult to obtain. Where are you at, my friend? Bro, I, I love that. Um, I'm right there with you. And, I, and I'm curious, like, do we now pull the trigger to start one gram of methylprednisolone um, in the interim, as we've ruled out these infectious etiologies, as this patient is rapidly deteriorating. And I just, I know we're running out of time, but I just want to show this, like what, what Robbie and I do on um, RLR. And because I think Castleman's can be a difficult thing to like understand, but on our, on our website right here with Castleman's, it's really three types, unicentric, which we're not talking because this is not a single lymph node, this is diffuse. So it's HHV8, multicentric Castleman disease or idiopathic. And here is where we're at folks, immunocompromised HIV. And Robbie said it, IL-6, and as you come down, hepatospinal megaly, edema, inflammation, diffuse lymphadenopathy. What else? Kaposis. But he said, why we're not worried about Kaposis? And already we're starting to think, do I need to inhibit those B cells with rituximab and decrease the inflammation? This is obviously, um, you know, beyond the scope of me and Robbie, but having those thoughts, like the other day, Robbie, we had a patient with Parkinsonism. And they had this diagnosis of vascular Parkinson's, Parkinsonism from basal ganglia infarct, but he's degenerating over time. So I talked to the neurologist. I was like, are we sure? Should we get a dopamine transporter scan to tease out Parkinson's disease? from?" And they agreed. So having the knowledge just helps you advocate for your patients, though you have to understand you're not the master or the expert, but you can advocate. So Mike, to you promise to close out the session and uh, yeah, and let us know where, where we ended up. Yeah, so um, we definitely consulted Hemong, and they said that just with the data, they think it's this new onset acute ITP, and with regards to the steroid, it's usually first line, but we held off of it just because there's concern for lymphoma or any kind of a hematologic malignancy, and we gave IVIG, and pretty much we were just trying to stabilize the patient at this moment. And unfortunately, um, the patient decompensated rapidly to a multi-organ failure, and he required intubation given the increased oxygen requirements. And then he was also on two pressor support, um, and his kidneys continued to deteriorate. Um, and yeah, so very unfortunate. Um, he passed away in a, within a couple hours in the next morning. Um, which is pretty much like day six of his hospitalization. And uh, the final autopsy results uh, showed actually is pretty remarkable. Um, it is immune reconstitution inflammatory syndrome associated Kaposi, Kaposi sarcoma, uh, potentially complicated by Kaposi inflammatory cytokine syndrome. Um, and what they found was a widely metastatic Kaposi sarcoma involving essentially all lymph nodes. Um, and they found metastatic deposits identified in the epiglottitis, trachea, liver, spleen, bilateral lungs, right kidney, and uh, this. Um, and then the carriers that was sent, um, because we couldn't really get an existential biopsy because he was too unstable, um, it came back also showing a uh, testing positive for uh, HHV8. Um, and so the pathologist kind of commented this presentation is consistent with probably a disseminated Kaposi sarcoma within months of initiating an uh, antiretroviral therapy that is component uh, consistent with iris KS. And um, there is also uh, associated with a very high rate of morbidity and mortality, especially kind of what Reza, you talked about. He seems to be a masking type. And um, <clears throat> when patients have pulmonary involvement, especially like a DAD type of picture, um, it is multifocal Kaposi sarcoma, which also patients have very poor prognosis when this happens. Um, and I have a couple of teaching points, but you guys can do some reflections first and then I can go into some teaching points. I am. Um, I'm just going to share my thoughts. Unfortunately, I have to break off because I have to go around right now with my team, but I just wanted to say, Robbie, this takes me back to my, and I'm getting a little emotional here. My intern year in San Francisco, 27 year old guy, acute hypoxemic respiratory failure. I went to do an ABG. I stuck myself. He had HIV, hep C. 
he died within two days and it was KS of the lungs. And um, yeah, this just brings me back to that patient and yeah, may he rest in peace. Thank you, Promise. And uh, thank you, everyone. Robbie, love you, man. Enjoy rounds, buddy. Um, the promise is so tragic to think about this this young person passing away at such a young age from something that is so de so deadly, but also so um, so treatable uh, earlier on in its um, presentation. And I think, um, yeah, I think um, I'm really grateful that you brought this learning to us. And I think it's not surprising that it required an autopsy to diagnose this case because um, it is uh, uh, this uh, syndrome that you that helped us diagnose today is um, a syndrome that I first learned about uh, on subspecialty VMR three or four weeks ago. Um, if you're interested in um, looking it up, I'm sure you can refine your search beyond this, but I think it is um, a subspecialty VMR with uh, um, with folks from Emory two or three weeks ago. And um, it's just absolutely devastating and really, really sad. And from a learning perspective, I think just highlights the the range of cancers that patients with HIV get, and that discussion is worth uploading. And the thing that's unusual here is to have Kaposi's sarcoma without mucocutaneous disease as a clue of what is hidden underneath. Vast, vast majority either have skin involvement or oral mucosal involvement. And you wonder whether because of his tachypnea and because of how sick he was, that it, you were either, he didn't have it or it was just hard to visualize because they can be very small, subtle lesions on his hard palate. So there's a lot of learning to be had in this case and a lot of mourning to do quite honestly for the, for the life lost. And I think as you start to untangle the many different aspects of learning here to recognize that in the vast majority of patients with this disease, there often is maybe a subtle clue that you can see with your eyes and maybe act on very quickly. So biggest piece of advice for the next instance you see a patient with HIV is a very, very good skin exam. And more importantly, because we may not think about it, a very good oral exam in every corner of um, their mouth. And I would guess that this person has a 50-50% chance of either he didn't and when one of those very unlucky people who did not have any oral disease whatsoever, but there's a 50% percent chance that he might have had a very small, subtle, but uh, management changing um, finding of oral um, chaos. So a lot to learn here. Um, and I'm curious um, what you have to reflect on promise, and then we'll recap the journey uh, with Ambush's teaching points. I think um, <clears throat> it was like a very, um, very tragic and serious case for our team and it was just, um, I think that after I had gone back to look at the case and then do reading, uh, I would agree that uh, would probably look closely into the skin exam. And then also uh, just keeping the, the fact that there could be um, like an atypical Kaposi sarcoma and the fact that he started the uh, art therapy recently and so always remembering the iris in the back of the head and um, literature has said if they have um, lung opacity on x-rays that kind of increases the probability of it and I think it's difficult because there's not really a diagnostic criteria per se but there are some clues that if like now that I look back um, that would make me a lot more worried and increasing the pretest probability, especially when this patient is so unstable that we cannot get like a biopsy um, to get the definitive diagnosis. And I was also kind of thinking, are there any ways that could have prevented this earlier? Um, and I think that it's the exam. And then given uh, it's like the biopsy option is pretty limited, and then potentially if we could have figured that out earlier, then he may be able to get um, systemic chemotherapy that would have helped. Um, but yeah, I think that I, it's a lot of gaps and I'm glad that I did this case so that I can learn a lot. And then hopefully with the next patient that comes, I would be able to remember this patient and then um, use everything that I've learned here to help the next patient. And you've amplified that learning so much promise by bringing it here. And hopefully many, many people will be able to learn from the wisdom that you've shared. I really, really appreciate it. Thank you very much.
Already, Amish, take us home, please. Um, thank you. Great case, uh, Promise. I really enjoyed this beautiful journey of this very complicated case and how Ravi and Reza broke it down for all of us. And I was actually making notes, so I'm going to keep looking at the screen and my notes um, and share with you guys what I learned. So first of all, uh, just quickly going over the problem representation, we had a young 27-year-old male with a recent diagnosis of HIV, and he was started on antiretroviral therapy. He presented to the ED with a possible seizure, progressive weakness in the leg, and he also had intermittent groin and neck swellings, which we uh, uh, believe were diffuse uh, lymphadenopathy. Then the labs indicated anemia, elevated inflammatory markers. Eventually, the serology came out to be positive for HIV, and the patient was diagnosed with disseminated or metastatic kaposi. And um, so I'm going to start off with how we went through this journey and what we learned along, along the way. So the first thing that Prof. Rez brought up was uh, the fact that um, a, a patient who started on HIV and how these patients' uh, immune system then becomes active and then they're prone to uh, you know, being exposed to antigen. So anything that is antigen dependent is woken up once you've started treatment in an immunocompromised patient. And then uh, he used another example, and we talked about IRIS, which is immune um, reconstitution inflammatory syndrome. And it is usually seen in patients who have recently started receive, receiving their HIV therapy and their immune system starts to recover. And then they have this robust you know, response to, the, to, uh, to small antigens and sort of opportunistic infections. And they show this overwhelming inflammatory response, which then gets treated with the use of um, anti-inflammatory drugs. He also talked about uh, another entity, unmasking iris, which is another robust reaction. Uh, and this uh, happens, for example, in a, in a patient who had TB, but was previously untreated, but now is, is being treated. And in that case, then you're unmasking iris. He also used another very interesting example about nemocystis jitterici. And I also recently uh, learned how nemocystis jitterici can present differently in a patient with HIV and without HIV. And that again, takes us back to the response of your immune system, right? Uh, moving on, Rabi then talked about how it's important in this case to be able to differentiate between syncope and seizure. And then he uh, pointed out two very um, uh, important things to keep in mind when you're trying to differentiate the two entities. So syncope can also present with abnormal movements, but keep in mind those movements are symmetrical. And then seizure is mostly accompanied by a post-ictal confusion state, which this patient did not have. So we kind of ruled that out. Moving on, Rabi also talked about how it's very important in an emergency setting to do a neck exam, to go for rapid imaging, and the need for a CT with or without CT of the neck and head with or without contrast to such patients, and also keeping the uh, keeping in mind the pretest probability of a space occupying lesion in the airway, and then very important uh, that once you are you're keeping that in mind, you want to see the condition of the patient. Rabi keeps talking about how you have to be vigilant and you have to see if the patient salivating if the patient salivating and obviously there is an immediate intervention that is needed. You want to secure the airway if the patient is stable, if the patient can undergo imaging, you can move on uh, and you know you're, you're, you're in the safe zone. Um, moving on, we talked about how um, uh, lymph nodes can be one of the biggest culprits when it comes to enlarged structures in the neck. And Ravi told us how uh, the biggest culprit is lymph nodes, followed by thyroid, followed by salivary glands. And then the lesser, uh, you know, serious culprits being the subtle ones in the background could be a congenital cyst that has now grown and become pathological, or it could be a vascular disease in the carotids. And then uh, something I really uh, like, Ravi said that HIV is inherently lymphotropic and we were constantly going over how there's diffuse lymphadenopathy. And then we talked about HIV related opportunistic infections and how this patient's kidney was affected. And then it could have been HIV related glomerulopathy, which is usually rapidly progressive, but it has a good prognosis with treatment. Rabi also talked about drug-related effects to keep in mind that this patient was on tenofovir, so it could have been Fanconi syndrome. It could have been drug-induced tubular interstitial nephritis, which then starts to cause end organ damage. Moving on, Prof. Press talked about identify, identifying the need for biopsy, which lymph node to access and which really are accessible, what type of biopsy is needed. And I really liked how he 
spoke about how FNA is not something that is very specific. FNA usually do not give us much information. So an excisional biopsy uh, is usually most accurate when it comes to diagnosing. And then um, he also talked about muffled voice and then Ravi talked about the need to secure airway and you know how muffled voice raises concern for an upper airway obstruction. And I've already gone over that. Then um, Ravi also mentioned how uh, comfortable posturing is important to kind of uh, you know relax the patient in the setting and then see how critical the situation is so the most comfortable position for this patient would be to keep to keep the patient upright and then see if the lymph nodes are palpable if and then kind of moving towards the next intervention which is whether they need their airway to be secured whether they need to be intubated or not and then uh, uh, as we went into the depths of this case, we came across the CBC findings, which raised concern for hemolysis. And then we talked about Mahas yesterday. We talked about Mahas again today and how, you know, then we were talking about ITP, TTP, HUS and all of those entities. And then we discussed severe hyponatremia. And then a professor talked about how it's very important to look at a previous sodium. So I've seen that in a clinical setting, it's always important to compare the new values to the baseline values. And that kind of gives you a lot, right, on this on the seriousness of the situation. We talked about how if somebody is presenting with severe hyponatremia, you want to do serum as well as urine osmose and kind of compare that. We talked about how in this setting there were there can be contributors. So in medicine, you know, it's very interesting that there's a lot of things going on and you kind of want to pick out the most important details and align your thought process and your, you know, diagnostic modalities and everything towards those. So in this case, we discussed how CKD uh, versus volume overload versus tumor lysis could be the contributors towards the patient's hyponatremia. We spoke about acute kidney injury. Uh, Rabi, a very important point that I actually wrote down uh, was that if you have AKI on CKD with hypertension, you want to think about vascular causes with glomerulopathy, glomerular disease being more prominent. And then if you have a patient with AKI without hypertension, you want to think about tubular interstitial disease. So that was a very good uh, point for me that hopefully I will remember when I start residency. Uh, and then uh, we had uh, we eventually found out that this patient had direct spooms positive anemia with spherocytes, with rule formation, and that kind of immediately took us all towards autoimmune um, hem hemolysis. And then we have warm and cold, and then we were all immediately thinking towards lymphoma. And then Rabi talked about the differentials, how we were thinking of about lymphoma being on our top. And then Kaposi, less likely, but that's the beauty of these cases that, you know, you're not thinking about something and that turns out to be the culprit. And then lastly, Castleman disease, which I've never heard of. So this is the first time I heard about it and two take home, home points for me looking at the schema that Dr. Uh, Dr. Prof shared <laughs> was that uh, my kidney injury without any overt tumor lysis is one thing to keep in mind that points towards Castleman and then diffuse lymphadenopathy. Those two entities, if seen together, should make you think of Castleman disease. And then finally, um, Promise already shared uh, the amazing points regarding this case is disseminated uh, Kaposi, and that was it for the teaching points. Thank you for listening. I think Dr. Prof is not here, but he'd be very, very proud. That was absolutely amazing. Thank you for walking through that whole journey, um, not skipping a beat of all the important things that, I, that the, the teaching points were made. Um, have a wonderful rest of the day and hope to see you guys. We have our very own uh, Alex Smith and his team coming from Northwell's uh, IMG program. And uh, for those of you who are able to make it, uh, we'll hope to see you there. Bye. <laughs>